Hello, everyone, and welcome to what would have been a episode of Handmade Hero, uh, but Linux ruined it. So instead, we're probably just going to have a really short stream today, and maybe I'll boot up Handmade Ray and play around with that a little bit. Because I'm not sure what else we could do, uh, since we've wasted basically all of our time trying to get Linux to capture audio, and mostly failing, although I guess maybe we slightly succeeded a little, very little bit. I don't remember where we left off on our Ray Tracer. Um, so, you know, it's it's a pretty uh, straightforward little simple program that we wrote as a stream test one time. Uh, and you can kind of see there's very little in it, right? We just sort of have a ray tracer, and then we have a couple support functions that are just like some math functions and stuff that we needed. Uh, and then we have like some uh, lane-based stuff here. So you can see we've got, uh, you know, a, a thing for SIMD where we can be like 8x wide or 4x wide. Um, and what we do inside here is we can actually sort of pick which one that we want uh, in the actual build. I believe we had a way of specifying what width we were using. I don't actually remember if it was in the build. Maybe it's not in the build. I don't remember. But uh, basically, we just pick between them uh, so that we can sort of say, do we want to use AVX2 or do we want to just use SIMD? And again, I really just don't remember uh, how we were picking that. Let me take a look and see. So it looks like it's just this pound define here, this lane width. Um, so I guess we could pick it in the, in the build if we wanted to. We could do this. Right, and if I just make that predicated, now we could define lane width in the build. And if we don't define lane width in the build, it'll just default to doing eight um, for now, right? Uh, but if, uh, if I go take a look at where we were at with the ray tracer, because I don't really remember um, in terms of, of running it, I believe what we did is inside this directory here, what we would do, uh, we yeah, we, we actually had sort of a, a procedure we would do where we would list like how we were doing on every day, right? Back when we did it. I mean, there was only four days, but. So if you take a look here, you can see uh, we would like record how long it took to do the ray tracing and like what the quality level was for each of these and how many total bounces there were and what the performance was and all this stuff, right? So we kind of had a pretty good setup here uh, just in terms of like, you know, starting to structure the ray tracer and, and here was, oops, I don't know why that's, uh, I don't know what that's doing there. Hello. There we go. Uh, so you can see like these are some of the tests we did on our ray tracer. They're just, you know, uh, some basic spheres that we put in here. Uh, and it produces pretty reasonable output, but there's no lighting function in it. So it's really like we didn't really have anything that actually tried to do any kind of real lighting. You can see here we've got like sort of glossy reflections by just the controlling how versus regular reflections, right? By controlling how spread out it was. But we really don't have much in the way of, of any real lighting in there. So I think the thing that we kind of stopped on was we never actually produced any real uh you know, w when we actually cast out rays, we just did the part where we see whether we hit things, and then if we hit things, we, you know, bounce, but we never actually did anything um, that tried to be more, you know, did any important sampling or computed any material properties or any of this sort of stuff, other than I think just a parameter for like how glossy it was or something like that, right? Um, and so probably what we would need to play around with next is we'd, we'd probably have to play around with uh, the part where we actually, you know, figure out how to do some kind of a, of, of a you know, um, some, some kind of a reasonable uh, argument for lighting. And you can see that the way that we broke things up here is we just have, here's a, a tile thing, right? We would say, look, let's get, let's aim at a, a particular pixel. Let's cast something out. Uh, in a direction uh, using this cast sample rays, and then we'll just write the, the thing back, right? So if we want to try and go a little further with this, we would probably start uh, editing this function, uh, which is, you know, right, oops. Why can't I cast oh, sample rays? <laughs> Why keep typing simple? Uh, this is the function that we'd really be looking at here, and we could, you know, we could start to, to work that out. So let me go ahead and try uh, getting the basis of uh, basics of this running again. And uh, I don't know if we actually made a batch file that would run it or not. Uh, looks like maybe we didn't. And so we probably want to make a batch file that runs it probably in the data directory. I don't know. Let me go ahead and see what happens when I actually run this thing. Because I don't remember what we programmed it to do either. Um, so it looks like that just kind of does some ray crafting, which is good. And there it goes. And then it's done. And, you know, there's the, uh, there's the output. 
that all looks pretty straightforward. Let me see if it generated a reasonable bitmap. I guess it's just that test.bitmap. Yeah. So I think it's pretty reasonable. We can run it, we get some output, and off we go. Uh, and then presumably we can crank down that sampling level as well if we want to. So meaning we could change it so that it outputted an image more quickly, but maybe had like less anti-aliasing. Because if you look in, you know, if you look and zoom in here, you can see we're casting like a lot of rays. Uh, even just you can see the level of anti-aliasing we're getting there. That's coming entirely from, uh, you know, just jittering the the ray cast uh, when we cast the ray out. Um, at, at the initial uh, setup. We aren't using blue noise right now. I think we're just using white noise. So that that sampling is not uh, great, um, but you can still see that we're just casting a heck of a lot of rays and everything comes out pretty smooth here, right? Uh, so so I think we're, we're super, you know, certainly well above where we would need to be sampling level wise. All right, so moving on, let's take a look here at what we can do. So you can see in the cast, the sample ray caster here, you can see we have a ray index and we're just going over how many uh, rays we want to cast. And you can see that we're, we're calling a random bilateral function here. So <clears throat> if you take a look at how the random bilateral is looking, uh, working, you can see us doing our, our sort of uh, how we're, you know, how we're generating our random numbers. You can see that it's sort of like three dependent XORs, right? Um, and I'm guessing that that's probably pretty good. Uh, I mean, it, I, we, we're probably going to be able to stick with that for a while. I, I don't know that we're going to need better source of entropy. We could do a little work on that. But like I said, I think that's probably fine. And probably all we really need to do is work on our bouncing. So if you see here, we do uh, a bunch of plane equations and we test all of the planes in the system uh, to see to what extent they are hit by the... Um, by the rays that we're casting. And then we go through our spheres and we raycast the spheres to see if they're hit. Uh, and then when we're done with that, all we do is say, well, now that we're done, uh, you know, n now that we've figured out where we're gonna hit, uh, we just load up whatever the material property is at that hit, which we've saved. You can see hit mat index here. Um, and once we know that, then we are, uh, I think, good to go for doing our light calculation. So you can see the light calculation actually just happens in here. You can see there's a cosine attenuation term, which is just there because uh, of the, you know, the light shaft, the, the incidence of the light shaft against the geometry is going to have a cosine fall off. Uh, and then you can see us just multiplying whatever that reflective color is there. Uh, and then what we do, uh, is, I think, is we just change the ray direction, right? So you can see it here. We do essentially a uh, interpolation between what a pure bounce would be and what a random bounce would be. Um, and we use a uh, b basically whatever that glossy coefficient is there uh, to determine how pure of a bounce versus how random of a bounce we want, right? And, you know, uh, again, the reason we say these are not accurate permutations, uh, I assume, is just because this, this part here, this is just a generic 3D offset, right, that's being applied. Uh, it's not really guaranteed to have any particular distribution over the hemisphere. We haven't really looked at that. In fact, we're not really even looking at what the hemisphere even is, right, at this point. And so this part right here is also pretty inaccurate just in terms of that, but it's probably also, again, not really the weakest part of the system. Uh, anyway, so then we go and uh, we, we're we going to loop, basically, so that you can see this thing here. It just goes until the max bounce count. And I believe it will just stop if it doesn't hit something. So like it'll bounce as many times as it can, and then you know it'll it'll end after that. So it's trying to hit a light source at some point, or at least it's hoping it hits a light source at some point, right? Uh, and if it does, it gets a color. If it doesn't, then it's just a useless ray that will contribute nothing, right? Uh, in a sense, it contributes something, which is to say that no light's coming from that particular set of bounces. So that's something, um, but again, not you know not particularly interesting uh, to a certain extent. So the other thing that we don't do here is we don't do any light source targeting. So you can kind of see we don't ever try uh, on purpose to like hit um, anything either. And so that's a that's a little bit of a of a uh, problem too, because if we wanted to start having some hard shadows, right? So if we wanted something that was sort of like a sunlight or a specific light source, and you can see we have a light source here, this red light source, for example. Um, we're not really doing anything in particular to try and make sure that we look at 
those light sources particularly well either. So there's that too. So I don't know what the first thing we probably want to do is. I think one thing we may need is some exposure control. So one of the things that, again, also that we're not doing here is we're not actually taking into account uh, the fact that we probably want to compute light values, like how much light we actually have, and then we need to expose the image, right? We need to basically take those light files and map them into the visual space somehow, um, probably using some kind of a nonlinear mapping, right? And right now we're not really doing that uh, either. We do do an sRGB encode, but that's not the same thing. That's just taking a set of light files and encoding them in. So I'm not sure, for example, what we set the light value of that red light to be. Um, I'm going to look at where we create the world. Uh, I guess that's here. You can see the materials uh, that we've set up. And if I look at the material structure, you can see in here we've got an emit color. And so you can see here we're emitting some stuff. <clears throat> this zero is probably the sky. Right, that's that background emission, uh, and here's like that that red uh, sphere, and so you know it's set to four, uh, which is like you know somewhat bright light, but we don't really know what these units are. We haven't specified them. You know, if I set that light up to twenty, I have no idea what would happen, right? Um, but I can go ahead and and run it here and see, right? Uh, but again, like because we don't really have any idea what those units are, or we don't really even have any idea of how we think they should behave, uh, it's pretty difficult to, to really say, right? So let me take a look. Uh, I assume I don't have this open already. Yeah, I don't. Uh, let me take a look at what uh, difference that creates. So you can see here, like if I was to turn that up, you get more, you can see that there's more light coming into the sort of parts that bounce. Um, and hit that. But again, like, you know, if we looked at what was happening here, I would say too, and you can see it's brighter in there as well, but one of the interesting things about it is you do see not that much light coming into these surfaces here, which honestly, you know, probably it should have. And, and one of the things that I think is, you know, possibly a problem there, right, is if we don't really know much about that sampling. So if we don't really have much of a way to uh, have that sampling take effect, I don't know... You know, I don't know if really, we, we, it feels like we should probably see more red in there, but to a certain extent we may not because we just, since we're just completely randomized bounces, it doesn't really know that it needs to look at that light source particularly much. Now, on the other hand, that part does seem to be catching a fair amount of the light um, coming in. So, you know, I don't know. Uh, again, just playing around with it a little bit to see where we're at in terms of what uh, what we're doing here. Uh, so let me run this one more time. I'm going to take a look at uh, what's happening here with the uh, with if I just keep cranking that that up more and more. Uh, and again, you can sort of see like, all right, so in here still you get very very little uh, of that red. In here you get a lot of it, um, but it feels like I don't really know to what extent that that doesn't feel super accurate to me. And, and maybe it is, you know, I don't know. Uh, but it doesn't feel super accurate to me. It feels like maybe it's, it's again, underweighting sort of the light that's coming from there. Uh, and I don't know. It could be possibly, too, because I don't really know very much about this surface. I, didn't, uh, I don't know if that, uh, what that's actually set to. We could take a look and see what the plane is set to. So it looks like that has a material index of 1, which is this. And again, that, so that just makes me suspicious, right? Because if it's a perfectly diffuse... Uh, surface and it has a perfectly gray reflectance you would th again you would think you would see more uh, of that light being uh, shown kind of in here and again maybe that's not true one of the things you would do if you were actually you know developing a ray tracer like this I think is you would want to try and get some references right so you'd maybe try and use an established uh, ray tracer to and ray trace the same scene or you do maybe the Cornell box or something like that right um, and so, you know, there, there's that. I'm kind of interested to see what happens if I introduce some more planes as well. So, for example, here's, you know, one plane equation that we were using. If I introduce another identical plane, uh, and you can see here what the plane structure looks like. It's just the normal, the D value, and the material index. So if I created another one that, let's say, pointed down positive X, and then I moved that backwards so, you know, it was kind of maybe a little, I don't really know what our units are here, so I, I'm not, again, not sure. It's been a while since we've uh, worked on this, but if I just place a plane somewhere, um, which is what I'm going to do here, uh, and take a look at what happens in, you know, in the case where I, I get, uh, 
You can see it slowed down, by the way, and the reason for that is because now a lot more things will be hitting that plane. Right. All right, so there's the plane, and uh, it you know cuts through here, and you know everything bounces kind of off of it. Uh, I will say it doesn't make a lot of sense to me exactly how that plane looks. It looks like, uh, do we have a really weirdly eccentric uh, sort of projection value? Because you would think that if it was, maybe it's really far away, I guess, but it doesn't really feel like it should have been quite so angled, right? Because this is directly onto the x-axis. I don't know where our camera is, though. Uh, so that's... So it looks like our camera is... It's supposed to be at zero in X, right? I mean, that's that's what that suggests to me. So I wonder if we're just very eccentric here um, because that doesn't feel quite right to me. Now, maybe it's because our units are, you know, maybe that plane is actually very far away. So let me try and let me just see what happens if I um, just move that uh, less away. I also wonder, do we have a thing for input inputting the rays per pixel so we can take... Uh, quicker snapshots that might be a good thing to add while we're at it so like in here do we actually you know do this arg count at all it doesn't look like we do in fact rays per pixel is just hard coded so what we might want to do is take a have uh, some way of inputting the max uh, or sorry the rays per pixel uh, just so this would go faster in those cases okay so that looks a lot better to me so i guess i just it, it's probably because that we're in meters or something roughly um so you can see that that makes a, a little more sense to me not sure what's going on in here. Um, I guess that's just where we intersect. So this is that plane, right? And you can see it doing a reflection of what it sees, right? I mean, sorry, this is that sphere, I mean. And this is where the sphere, like, intersects uh, with it, right? Um, so that's just, you know, I guess sort of what you would expect. At least I believe that's what's going on there, right? That would be where the that's the sphere line right there, so it intersects like right about there. All right. Um, all right. So let's try to improve how we're doing the lighting here. And the first thing I'd like to do is maybe start to have uh, the light vary based a little bit on direction. And again, I think we're going to have to start putting in in order to decrease the noise. We're going to have to start putting in some important sampling. Uh, just to figure out like where light sources tend to be coming from and to try to sample those a little bit more specifically uh, than, than we were sampling the other ones, right? Uh, I also think it, it, if we don't have pure red light, which is, you know, you, you're never really going to have a pure red light. I'm curious what this would do to the scene as well. Uh, let's go ahead and add that so I can, I can make this raise per pixel be something that we can uh, configure on the command line as well. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to say like if arg count uh, equals two, uh, raise per pixel equals uh, ATOI uh, on that args one. So that'll just allow us to very quickly, you know, at the command line, if I do this, we'll get 1024. If I want to, I can say, oh, actually just use 256, right? Um, or some other small number. And that just allows us to take a sample much quicker and it'll just be noisier, right? Um, so again, uh, it, it makes reasonable sense. And like, as you can see, it's even with how crappy it is, it still looks okay, right? Like, in other words, it does seem to be doing a good job of producing lighting that, you know, is at least somewhat plausible. I just don't know to what extent I really believe that that it feels like it's undercounting the lighting in in some places here. I, I I don't know. That's just that's just a my intuition. I feel like there's a little bit of weirdness going on there. Um. So let's go ahead and see what we want to do. Uh. Yeah. Going forward here. So assuming that we want to improve the lighting quality a little bit, when we take a look at how we're doing our bounces here, um. I guess what we'd like to do is have some way too of, of in here specifying some kind of um, reflectance function that, that actually makes some sense, right? And I don't know if there's these days, I, I feel like there's some pretty standardized BRDF functions uh, floating around out there. And so maybe what we'll do, I guess this is actually official, so I'll, I'll keep it in the search history. Um, maybe what we'd like to do is look for a standardized BRDF. Uh, I think Disney standardized on one. Um, and I don't really remember, 
Um, exactly what they were. Uh, but I was thinking, you know, we could we could just see if what what that um what that would be. Because I thought there was a simplification one they did. And I figured if we could tie into a standard one, then that would make it easier to put in, like, I figure, like, they probably have, um, yeah. So I think this is the thing I was thinking of, right? So we could probably do something where we could sort of tie into something that someone had already standardized and then just use that, right? So you can see here, like, they've got kind of... Uh, a set of parameters that they decided, you know, to use for their films, uh, which I don't know if maybe that makes everything look like a plastic Pixar movie, but, you know, uh, prob presumably not. Uh, presumably they tune it that way because they like it that way, right? Um, but I don't know. So I'm just kind of looking to see, do they have a simplified, like, yeah, like it looks like that, right? Um, but I wonder if they have one of these that is simplified down uh, and they say, like, look, here's a material library for it or whatever, right? And looks like they don't summarize this very well, but... Our base diffuse model is this. So they basically say... one plus FD 90 minus one, one minus cosine theta to the fifth power. Okay. One plus FD 90 minus one, one minus cosine to the fifth power as well over the ba the base color over pi. So I'm assuming it looks like none of this, it looks like they really only just have that one roughness parameter and then the base color parameter. Um, so this would be pretty easy easy right for us to put in there just looking at it and so the base color is obviously just the color the roughness value is this one and you can see right it goes from here to there uh i'm not 100 percent sure where's the rest of the stuff for specular and do they actually talk about that specular d so here's their specular stuff. And I'm assuming then we combine all these terms. They're combining all these terms in the standard way, which I believe they listed up here, right? I'm guessing. No, that's just the general, that's just the general microfacet. Do, do, do. So do they break that down again, or do they just use it that way? It's always hard to read papers on stream. So I don't know. I'm going to say let's tr let's see if we can go for this. Maybe this is a bad idea. Um, you know, um, here's the Disney principle. Uh, uh, here's the Disney principle uh, BRDF in a shader toy, right? So, yeah, like if we look... Here it is, right? Um, if we look, this looks like exactly what it says in the paper, right? And let's see here. This is basically exactly what we want to do. Just going to make sure that it actually looks like what I think it would look like. Yeah, so, I mean, it looks like they are literally just doing that. 
All right, so let's try this, and and we'll just try to to you know redo these uh, parameters ourselves, right? So let's do the Disney. Let me see what the best uh, summary one is I can find of it. Uh, it may just be this paper, um, but maybe there's uh, another place uh, that we can look. Uh, we'll just grab some of these things here. What's this? Uh, so here's some reference code too. It looks like this code is the actual Disney one. Like this is copyright Disney, right? Um, so th this presumably is what they actually think the code should look like, right? Um, now this is a little bit obfuscated, right? Because we don't know exactly how they worked these out. Uh, so, you know, we may have to go back and kind of work it through ourselves to make sure that we know what we're actually doing in each of these cases. Because if we were to just like use this code directly, we wouldn't really know what we were doing, right? Because it's just like all rolled into to one. But we can at least use that as a reference, I suppose, uh, separately, right? Um, let's take a look here. I assume this is the same PDF we were looking at. Because this is just the same thing, right? Yeah. All right. Um, so I think we have enough information here uh, to just kind of, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That doesn't look very good. I'm, I'm hoping this is a good good idea. Maybe this is a stupid idea. I don't know. Um, I'm hoping this is a good idea, uh, but but I don't know. You can also see here, like, here's, like, uh, here's another reference implementation uh, that somebody else did. And uh, this is an Arnold, right? So that's the standard. I think this is an Arnold. Is that right? Uh, so this that's the standard ray tracer that like most people use in like film, right? You can see that a render man. So I think we're all right. We can kind of proceed from here. So let's take a look at what's going on. So this right here, they're listing the standard micro facet model. A micro facet model, for those of you who don't know what that is, is basically saying, look, what really happens with light is, you know, you've got photons and they hit a surface and the surface we think of as flat is actually made up of a lot of little fine surface detail where all the atoms are arranged in particular ways. And so what we want to do is talk about the actual like small surface geometry and how that reflects photons that will tell us how to actually compute, you know, a lighting function. And as you can see here, it's like, well, there's some diffuse term, you know what I mean, that we don't know what it is. You can see here it's like of unknown form, right? Uh, and then you've got this term here, which actually tells you something about the uh, way that the lighting comes in. And you've got a bunch of thetas in there. And the reason that you have a bunch of thetas in there is because, of course, you have the direction that the light's coming in and the direction that the light's going out, right? And you can see here that they've kind of defined how they're going to talk about it. They say if a surface reflection can occur between a given light vector L. So L is the incoming uh, ray, you know, that's going to bounce out. View vectors V, so that's the direction we're sampling. You don't have to think of these as light and view. Uh, you don't have to think of them as like the light source and the camera. You can think of them as instead of just like what direction are we trying to figure out how much light is going out and what direction are we looking in to see how much light is coming in, right? So you can think of them more that way, right? Uh, so anyway, there must exist some portion of the surface or micro facet with a normal aligned halfway between L and V because that's what's going to reflect, right? And so here's how they create that vector using H. And then they say, all right, here's the general form for it. We have a D function that's going to be based on the half vector, an F function that's going to be based on something that they did not define. Why did they not define D? Am I missing something? <coughs> um, yeah, great. They totally left it out, it would appear. 
Anyway, L and V, which we just talked about. Uh, so I, I don't know. Why, why did they not define D? They, I mean, we can go back to here and, and look at what it is, but that's really weird, don't you think? Oh, there it is. Here it is. Here it is. Theta D is the difference between L and the half vector. So basically that we can just compute, right? All right, so most physically plausible models are not specifically described in microfacet form and can still be interpreted as microfacet models and they have a distribution function, a Fresnel factor, and some additional factor that could be considered a geometric shadowing factor. Geometric shadowing factor just means like how much the microgeometry actually like prevents photons from hitting other parts of the microgeometry, right? The only real difference between microfacet models and other models is whether they include the explicit one over term, right, which is this right here. Uh, for models that don't include that factor, an implied shadowing factor can be determined by multiplying the model by this after factoring out. So, okay, that all makes reasonable sense, right? I mean, it doesn't tell us anything because it hasn't told us anything about what these functions actually are, but at least we know the structure of it now, right? Like, that's not so mysterious now because we broke it down into what these things actually mean. For those of you who always ask, like, how do you read papers? Like, slowly is the answer, right? Uh, so anyway, uh, here's them showing a bunch of, I think, the. I, I'm guessing Merle 100 is, because uh, I probably knew at some point, but it's probably just a giant capture set where they took actual materials and put them under, like, a gonio reflectometer. Uh, so it's this thing, right? Uh, and what you can do with a gonio reflectometer is basically you can put something into it. And what it's going to do is it's going to have like a very accurate like photo dete photon detector, right? And a very accurate photon emitter. And it's going to try and like shoot photons at the surface from a very specific angle and collect how many photons come out at a very specific angle. And so it can build basically a complete model of how a particular surface reflects light, right? Uh, and you can do this in different ways, right? You can collect at multiple places at the same time. Um, you can build, like, basically, like, a poor man's gonio reflectometer by basically just putting cameras and light sources in various places and seeing what happens. Um, but basically, like, that's what happens, right? Uh, and for our purposes, because we're just trying to do, like, computer graphics, not uh, actual simulation, like, we're not trying to do physics here. We're trying to do, like, pretty pictures, we don't really need like a real gonio reflect reflectometer or a real BRDF. Um, and that's exactly what Disney's talking about here. They're basically saying, look, let's start with the real world and how the real world looks. And then what we're going to do is we're going to try and figure out what set of parameters we can give artists to make them, uh, cr uh, give them the ability to create services that appear like they work and exist in a real world like the one we're used to, but so that they can be more artistic about it and not actually have to worry about whether it's really simulating light or what material is really on, you know, uh, Woody's shoe in Toy Story or something, right? So Merle is a set of uh, samples that are captured, right? So you can see here they were taking paints, woods, metals, fabric, stones, rubber, plastic, right? All kinds of things. Uh, and apparently you can just get this, right? And you can, you know, use it. Uh, if we actually looked at that um, here, right, you can see the Merle database. You can, you can see the actual um, results here. I guess you could probably just download these, right? So if you look here, uh, here's a binary... Uh, of each of these things. And, you know, honestly, if we wanted to, we could just go that route. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Maybe we should. I don't know what the format is here. We could take a look at, like, the README um, uh, and see if it says, see here, here's the reader, right? Um, so, you know, maybe we go that route. Here's, here's an example, right? You can see uh, it doing the read here. So it calls read BRDF. Read BRDF basically says like, all right, you know, F read this thing in. Uh, and you can see like there's a theta. A, um, so, so there's two angles, right? Uh, and uh, then it says, yeah, why does it, how many is it reading here? Dims, size. It's just reading the dimensions of it. Oh, I see. Never mind. Sorry. It's just reading in first a counter that says how many of them there are, and then it reads the whole thing, right? So you know what? This seems a little more fun to me, right? Because we don't have any artists right now, and so we can't tune anything. So maybe we just do this, 
this seems a lot better. So what if we just downloaded this? Um, let's see what the license is on it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, into a commercial product. So we're not making a commercial product. So I think we're okay there, right? Um, and presumably we can just download these and use them. Now, maybe there's one that's more permissive uh, that would let people use it in a commercial product. Um, I don't actually know. Let me take a look. Um... Doesn't look like it. I don't know if anyone can think of one. Maybe we can use that. But uh, you know, uh, I'm assuming that they would be okay uh, with this as an educational use, since this is literally what we would be using it for as educational purposes. Um, so I'm assuming that they're okay with that, and we can include the copyright notice uh, in there as well. And actually, I don't have to distribute it. In fact, that's even better. I just won't include it. We'll just download it and put it in a separate directory. And then anyone who wants to can use it, and that way it won't get distributed with anything we do. So even if they don't like the fact that fact, uh, it's okay. So it won't, it, we won't be distributed. We'll just show how to load it uh, if you wanted to. So let's go in here and uh, download some of these things. I don't know if you have to literally download them all manually. That seems like a real pain in the ass. Um, ooh, pain in the butt. I'm not supposed to swear. Um, but uh, I don't know. It doesn't look like there's any way to download it as more of a of a group. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just download some of these here. So, uh, in fact, let me take a look and see if if uh, is there one that's particularly good. Uh, I don't I don't actually know. It doesn't look like there's any way to see which ones are which on here. Um, so let me go ahead and download some of these. So let's download some of these here. Uh, let's take brass for example, since it's something we might um, have an idea about. Uh, let's take something else like uh, light red paint. Um, red fabric, uh, silver metallic paint. I don't know. Uh, two layer gold, two layer silver. Um, I don't think there's anything else we want here. Gray plastic sounds good. Chrome. Aluminium. Probably want some less exciting things too. Green fabric. Light brown fabric. Neoprene rubber. Um... Seems okay. Now we've got some, right? Uh, and then I don't see anything here that says what the structure of it is, but since there's a BRDF reader involved here, I'm assuming that we can just go ahead and uh, load this in. It looks like they have, you know, three parameters here, theta H, theta D, and phi D. Um, I'm not sure why you would have a three parameter model, but I guess that's because you don't really need the additional one, I'm not sure. but So we probably want to look and see how these are encoded because I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I guess we could try and reverse engineer it from the code. Uh, but it would be nice if I could find some docs. I would rather be able to read about it, right? Like, um, please reference the following paper. Uh, a data different re reflectance model. Let's take a look at that. All right. Um, so here is, ah, good, 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 good. This is what we need. We just needed something, right, uh, that would tell us what we were supposed to interpret these values as. And so you can see here, n is clearly the surface normal of the thing that we're reflecting off of. So that helps. T looks, looks like a tangent vector to the surface. So those are pretty easy for us to understand. Um, and yeah, I don't know which ones they're using. Okay, so it looks like this. So they're using F uh, 
D and phi D plus pi, uh, like I think. Yeah. Um, so in here, we're basically saying, all right, uh, 90 bins for H and D. So H and D looking here. So there's H, right? Uh, phi h, sorry, uh, there's h, and there's phi d, uh, theta d, so theta h, theta d, right? Uh, it's a little hard to read that diagram, honestly. Uh, I'm not sure where that angle's being measured off of. I think it's being measured off the half angle. So I think theta d is the is the drop down of uh, omega i here, or wait, wh I, that's not omega. What is that? Uh, wait, I don't know what that is. What letter is that? It is omega. Oh, never mind. I was like, I don't know if there's a way to, I know there's a way to digital, but I'm like, I don't remember there being a W. And I was right. It was Omega. Never mind. Shouldn't doubt myself. I usually doubt myself when it comes to math things because I just don't do it very often. So it falls out of the brain quickly. They should use this as the way to digital logo and just say it's a new Greek letter called way to. All right. Anyway. Uh, so Omega I here, in this case, I think that's what theta D is measuring and theta H is measuring here. Um, and so let's see. So they're basically saying they they restrict this by saying we're only going to sample for th for theta d, right? We're only going to sample instead of allowing this to vary arbitrarily, or I guess I should say uh, this phi d here, where they had um, I don't know where that was. They don't actually show an original phi D, it looks like. But instead of allowing it to vary arbitrarily, they're basically saying, all right, we're going to pretend that we always do a 90, uh, I'm sorry, a pi, which would be a 180, right, uh, off of it. So I'd like them to show another diagram there because I'm not sure exactly what they mean by that. Since they didn't actually show it in the thing. Let's take a look. Um, let's see, found that specular peaks were difficult to represent using the natural coordinate system, theta in, theta out, and phi diff, uh, and phi diff, again, not really talked about here. Uh, I guess we have to go read the reference paper for that, which would be unfortunate. I'd rather they just said exactly what it was. Um, because again, I'm just having trouble with this last term. These two are obvious because they actually drew them, right? Um, well, I, even that's a little bit not great, but that's the angle from the normal to the half vector, right? Uh, and that's the angle from the half vector to the outgoing. But what is that? Um, maybe that's just a really bad phi. Oh, maybe that's all it is. Maybe that's just a really bad phi. Oh yeah, it is. So never mind. It's just because they used a really weird phi here. So never mind. Okay, so we've got it. So basically what they're saying here is like, okay, so phi d in this case, um, I guess they're trying to measure the angle of... Gosh, it's kind of hard to read that. Right? You can see why I'm having trouble with this diagram. This angles coming off we're tr we're saying phi d is like the angle around the like the rotation angle around and then theta d is the rotation this way so that we're so basically like if you imagined this was drawn as a plane we basically have the rotation in the plane is phi and then the rotation like kind of in the perpendicular like to bend it downward is theta d right i mean it looks like that to me so if we were to look at what this is showing here they're basically saying like okay um we are doing a plus phi i'm sorry a plus pi uh 
rotation here, um, we're saying that if we were to rotate this thing 180 degrees, meaning if we were going to, you know, basically like flip it around here, they're saying that we believe the function will be the same. So we're not going to sample it uh, with, with the flip, I guess, right? So normally they would have done 360 bins and now they're doing 180 bins, I guess. I mean, that's, that's how I read that. I don't know how you folks read that, but that's how I read that. Um, so then we get our samples and off we go. And so then at that point, what we really just need to do is create w whatever these values would be, right? We need to actually figure out what these values are to feed into our function here. Uh, and then we can look them up, right? So that's the, that's the goal. And we can look them up in the actual table and then have our reflectance, which is going to be very costly and probably slow, which is why I say we probably need to, uh, you know, use a simplified thing eventually, but I'd like to try using this uh, as our first thing so that we can actually use real measured materials and see what they look like. So if we go ahead and take uh, this model and try to implement it, right, uh, what we're effectively going to need is a 3D lookup uh, of, this, of this thing, and we're going to need to do that. We're going to need to construct what those parameters are based on the reflectance that we end up seeing. So let's go back to the source code here and uh and see oops no 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 wait where's the wait how come you can't undo close tab anymore what happened that uh i guess that did it um all right so taking a look at the um uh the source code here in brdf read so what it looks like uh, they have is just three dimension values, which tell us how many of each thing there are. Uh, and then there's just exactly them. And they've pre-said basically that they have to be this exact resolution. Uh, so I guess that makes our job a little easier uh, because these values will actually just be exactly correct, right? Um, now, I don't know if we care about that part so much, uh, but maybe for lookups, it's good to have it be that way. Uh, I doubt it matters that much. But so for the moment, I think we will forego that and, and we'll, we'll try to make it be a little bit more arbitrary. All right. So what I'm going to do here is take material and I'm going to have like a uh, BRDF table. Uh, and BRDF table is just going to have like a count for these three things. Uh, and then it's going to have a values uh, pointer. And we're just going to look them up in here. Uh, this table is just going to be very simple. And each one of these materials is going to be able to have a BRDF table pointer in it, I guess. Like this. Um, and so if we want to, we can now have each one of our materials have some kind of a, of a, a BRDF with it. In fact, I guess we don't really have to do it quite that way. What we could do is just put the, weld the actual table directly in there, right? So we could have the BRDF table just exist like this. And so what we could do is have it like so that we know whether or not things are a light source or not uh, based on the emittance, I guess. Uh, or I guess we could make the BRDF table itself have those emission values in there. Um, I'm not sure how we would actually exactly do that. I guess we would have maybe uh, uh, some kind of a information in here about how much light is coming off versus how much light is being reflected or something like that. Um, but anyway, I think that's all we would really have to do. So here we, we know we're 90, 90, 360 in this case, but uh, again, I'm not going to hard code that in. So I'm just going to make a quick function here that will load the BRDF table into memory. Uh, and so if we want to load these BRDF tables, we just can. So here there's going to be a, like a load BRDF like that. Uh, I believe we have internal, right? Yes, we do. So what I want to do is load those in. They are F32s, right? Or at least can be represented as F32s. Are they doubles in this, this world? What are they? So it looks like they're doubles. Uh, we don't actually need doubles. So I will probably elect to convert. Uh, them rather than, yeah, rather than, than not. But what I'm going to do here is just say, okay, there's a load BRDF 
uh, and and maybe we'll say load Merl because different people could have different BRDF formats. So we'll say this is a Merl file since we know that it's uh, a Merl binary uh, that comes from them, right? So I'm going to say that here's the file name. Here's the file. I'm going to do an F open on it. Um, and we want to read it as a binary file. So I'm going to pass an RB there. Uh, going to go ahead and uh, make sure we put out errors. Uh, and here I'm just going to print out if we can't open the file just so the user knows, you know, you're in the wrong directory or you didn't provide the right files or who knows what. So if I open the actual file, I'm going to do an F read to get the, uh, so the, the actual um, dimensions in there. And again, I'm going to want to give this a target, like where do you actually read this thing? So I'll call that the destination. So in order to do the F read, you can see here there it's just three integers apparently. So they literally just wrote like three integers in a row out at the beginning. Um, so all I should have to do is basically read those into our ints here directly, presumably. So we can just say like, there's the count. Uh, we're going to do an F read and uh, the F read needs to take the file pointer in the, the in size, but otherwise uh, it doesn't. I don't think I'll do this the way they did it. They were saying, look, here, um, here's the destination. That'll be the same. We're doing three ints. I'm just going to multiply it out myself. So I'm just going to say, look, uh, it's just going to be the size of this thing here. And I'm going to read one of them. And that's it. Uh, it's the same exact thing. Oh, that was correct. It's the same exact thing they were doing, but I'm just, instead of doing the multiply there, I'm going to let C do the multiplication for me. So I'm going to read those in. Then I'm going to allocate uh, the, the amount of space I'm going to need here. So I know I need to load um, the number of F32s that would be implied by that basically three-wide, uh, three-dimensional table. So it's going to be desk count zero times desk count one times desk uh, count two. That's the entire thing. Uh, what I'd like to do here is say, well, we kind of know we're going to have to read this right after we allocate it. Uh, and we also know we need to load uh, in it as doubles, actually. So we're going to need two things here. So what I'm going to do is say there's a total count, right? So we have like a total count value that would be this. Uh, also, I don't know that I want these as ints. I think I'm going to use these as U32s instead. So let's say there's a total count here. And then there'll be t uh, a couple different total sizes. So there's going to be a total read size. Uh, and that total read size is just going to be the total count times the size of a double, right? So it's an X64. Uh, like so. Uh, and then there's a total table size. And that's going to be a total uh, count times a float. So then what we can do is allocate the total read size and the total table size. Like so. And then I need to read and convert. So I'm going to do an F read into my temp table of the total read size, like this. Uh, and then I'm going to do a conversion. And so you can see here, I'm just trying to make this as simple as possible for myself. And that's just converting, down converting from a double, which is way more precision than we need, uh, into something much simpler, right? So that would presumably do it. I'm going to close the file off here. Uh, and I'm going to free the temp memory because we won't need it anymore. Uh, but that's about it, right? Um, Oops, sorry. All right. uh, I think that's all we really needed. And so now we have the ability to load these Merl binaries. Uh, I need to actually put them somewhere. So I don't actually know where that downloaded to. Probably the desktop. Yep. I'm going to grab all of these. Like so. Uh, and then I'm going to go over to uh, our W here. And I'm going to go ahead and make in here...
I wanted a new folder. I want a new folder. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to make a Merle directory. And I'm going to go ahead and paste this in there. So now we've got our uh, Merle stuff here. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, try and load some of these up. Right? And just we'll go in through the debugger and, and see if it works. So I'm going to go to OD, which will uh, put us into debug mode. I'm going to try and load some Merle binaries in for these things here. Um, so for each of our materials, I'm going to try and load in a Merle binary uh, and, and put it in here. I, we don't really know what these are supposed to be. Um, and you know what? Now that I think about it, wait, I missed some. I must have missed something. Oh, yeah. So they, I was going to say they should be red, green, and blue. And there are. So there's three each. So it's RGB, right? So it is a little bit different. Let me go ahead and uh, fix that first before we do any of this. But we're going to go ahead and do Merle binary here, uh, load Merle binary. And I'm going to go ahead and take these materials. Uh, what I might do is, at first, I might say, let's take some of the planes out here. I'm sorry, take some of the spheres out. So we have a much simpler scene. This way we only have like one plane and uh, one sphere. And that way we can just use materials zero, one, and two. And then we'll load binaries into each of those. Uh, don't ask me why I did that. I meant this. And so this way I can target each of these. Uh, and just see if this works at all. So we can load materials into each of these. Uh, they're going to be like whichever ones we want. So maybe like gray plastic can be uh, sort of our, our base one here. This material zero, I guess, doesn't need one, right? Because it's not reflective. It's just the sky or whatever, right? Um, load Merle binary uh, uh, for this last guy here, gray plastic. Uh, we'll use something more reflective or interesting, like chrome. Right? Uh, and we'll just see if we can get this working at all. So if we do that, like I said, we got to expand this to be by threes. And that also means that the material should be by threes as well. So it should be like this, right? And so then in here, uh, when I do this malloc, what I actually want is this should be size of V3, and this should be size of S64 times 3. Uh, then when we do the total count, and we go through here, um, I guess we, we don't really have a V64, uh, but that's okay. And so when we go through total count, uh, what we would want to do here is actually step this like that. And we'd want to do something like this. Right? So what we'd want to do is do like, all right, three times value index plus zero, three times plus one, three times plus two, right? And convert those all to float and then bundle them into a V3. And then we have like successfully like compacted that information, right? Uh, so I think that's what we need. Um, Ooh, why are you complaining? Lane V3. Wait, lane V3? Oh, is V3 always a lane V3 currently? Do we not have any way to talk about a lane V3, a, a V3 normally? Oh, so we just made that be lane V3 always. All right. Well, I don't really care about that. That's fine. And we may need to change the format of these anyway, uh, because we don't really know how what the best way to load these is going to be. Um, although I would imagine we won't have much of a choice because it's going to be different for each lane. So there is that. Um, so we'll try to load up these uh, Merle binaries here. Uh, the problem that we're going to have is, you know, when we are actually looking at sort of the input and the output here, 
uh, we're going to have a pathing problem, right? So we need this, the, we need to know where these materials would actually be because uh, we don't know, right? So we need some way of supplying like a material path. For the moment, I'll hard code it, but we're going to need something better than that eventually, right? Uh, so let's suppose we did that. Let's see if I go into uh, Remedy, what happens. I'm going to change my working directory to be the data directory here. Yeah. Oops. Uh, so that all seems good. And then I'll run it. That doesn't look good. Let me take a loop in there. So looping over this, see what the total count is, and I just want to see what the rest of the stuff is. Uh, ninety ninety eighty. Uh, that'll just do all the conversions. Free it. All right. So that seems to work. Why are we not getting any printout here, though? Did I break something? I'm not sure. What? I must have a read error. What did I do wrong there? Read that in. Total read size. That seems right. That looks correct to me. We are reading the correct number of things out of temp. That all seems reasonable. Why am I getting a, uh, why am I getting a bug there? What am I missing? Probably just being stupid. It was a bad stream day today. As you know, Linux totally ruined my life. Um, the total table size looks good. That all looks, that all looks good. What's, what's wrong? Why don't you like that? Please, please crash again. Let's set it down to a very low number of rays as well. <laughs> so maybe it's just very slow. Uh, and let me take a look at what, what it output as well. There's our test bitmap. All right. So that's okay for starters for our test bit map um so what i'm gonna do now is since i don't I, I don't know why that hit a crash there that's really kind of weird and disconcerting um but anyway what i want to do now is actually sample this this uh value so when we hit something here and we want to figure out what the reflection is so you can kind of see here we have like a bunch of terms and what we want to do is actually just use the values that we get in. Now, there's some weird stuff that we probably need to start taking account of now, um, which is you can kind of see there's some weird, like, uh, I don't know why there are these scaling values in here, right? Um, and so I kind of want to see uh, if they explain what those are. Um...
So I don't see a lot of explanation here about what the scaling values are actually there for. Because since they're storing floating point values, I'm not sure why you would scale anything, because you wouldn't you have just baked the scale into the actual file. Um, so I'm not sure what those are meant to represent. Right, you see what I'm saying? Uh, and those values show up in here too, right? So yeah, so here's lookup BRDF value, right? And here's like, they're saying, if this is the, this is the input theta, you know, this is, this is the input, um, angles. You can see here that they say, give me the results. And the results they give you are scaled by these values. But I don't know why. Like, why wouldn't you just scale the values in the file? Right? I mean, I'll I'll go one further and just say I also don't really understand why aren't they using the actual offset lookups? Like, here's the double table for BRDF, and they do basically like end, which is where you are in the file, right? And then they do the stride over two for the green and over nothing for the blue. That's a really weird way to look that up. Is it not just like, like, do you understand what I'm saying? Why is this so complicated? Like, why isn't it just three times index plus one or something? Did they, did they write these out in a really like idiosyncratic way? Theta diff index times BRDF sampling res phi over two times theta d. It looks like they wrote them out like blocked. Like maybe the RG and Bs go strided, but I can't really tell. Right? I mean, that's what it looks like they did here which is nuts. I have no idea why you would do that. Why don't you just do RGB, 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 RGB? I mean, right? Um, so really what that means is this is not correct, right? So actually what goes on here apparently is this is the red channel, I guess, meaning if we look at what the dimensions are of this thing, um, you can see here, okay, so we've got beard of sampling res theta H, sampling res theta D, uh, feed, uh, the, the feed over two is, you know, what they're saying they're doing because they have, they, they, they did that plus pi mirror. That's the plus pi mirror getting folded in there. So you have half, uh, the resolution. So in here, we would basically say like, okay, if we, um, if we assume that this is how that looks, then this look up here, the red all comes first. So the first full, to full count of values are the reds. The greens are after one of the third dimensions worth of things. And they're looking that up. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, never mind. The greens are after H times D times two. So that's the greens are one red next. And then this is two reds next. Okay. So it's green, 
it's then like however many there are in one uh total count So I want to say that's what it's doing. So it's reds, greens, blues in this way, right? So it's RGB. That was really hard to untangle, but that's all they're really doing here. They just don't have a stride. This just happens to be the stride. And this just happens to be twice the stride because phi D is normally divided by two, right? It's fine. Um, so then what we want to do is be able to construct, we want to be able to look up into this table. So what we need to be able to do is when we actually go to compute this bounce, so in here, right, what, <coughs> um, what we want to be able to do is create the ray direction here and get the uh, attenuation factor, uh, right, uh, you can see here, apply the correct attenuation factor. And so all of this stuff is still the same, right? But in order to get this attenuation factor, what we need to do now is base it on more than just the cosine, right? So what we want to do is move the attenuation computation down, right? So we want to do this. And then based on this ray direction, uh, and we don't really need cosine of 10 anymore, like uh, that is going to be rolled into the BRDF now because we've got sampled data. So what we need to be able to do is say, all right, uh, we have the normal of the surface that we hit, I guess, right? Uh, and we need to do the attenuation here for whatever the thing is that we're bouncing off of. And so we have the ray direction that we're outgoing uh, and we have the ray direction that we were coming from, which is this, and we need to store that. So this is going to be like the next ray direction, right? And then after we do our computation, uh, we would we would compute it like we would assign it in. So based on the ray direction and the next ray direction, so those two things combined, we need to be able to do our sample. So somehow out of those two, we ha and and the normal that we're actually using the next normal there. I also don't know when does that get assigned. Does that get assigned up here somewhere? Where does next normal? Um, So it's not really next normal. It's really just normal, right? We don't actually keep that value. So it's the normal that we hit. It's just called next normal for no really good reason here. All right. So what we need is here we need our uh, reflectance, right? So here we need our, like our ref C value. And what we're going to do here is we're going to take our ref C value and we're going to apply it. And so our ref C has to come from a BRDF lookup. And the BRDF lookup is going to be whatever the material is in this particular case. And presumably we did do the material lookup at some point here. Um, so you can see we did a gather um, right here for, for that mat lookup. Because remember, this is wide now. So basically what we need to do here is this, uh, I guess this is a lane V3, right? Yeah. So what we need to do here is say, all right, um, when we do this ref C, we need to do a wide lookup and we're going to be providing to our BRDF lookup function, which is going to have to do a gather. Um, we're going to have to provide that information. Now, what I don't know is the emit color here, right? When that does the load, I don't know where matte emit color was getting used. Let me find that out. So the emission just always gets added in immediately. So that's fine. So we don't need to edit that part at all, right? So all we need to do now is, is implement a BRDF lookup function, and we know what the material uh, hits were. Uh, and we know what our, all of our information is here. So in terms of uh, the two vectors, it's negative ray direction, it's the next normal, 
uh, and then it's the ray direction, next ray direction, right? And with that in mind, we can build our BRDF lookup function, which is going to be slow, but that's fine. Uh, and so in here, we've got world materials. This is our material array. And uh, we've got the mat index, which is going to be a lane uh, U32. Uh, we've got our ray direction here. Uh, that's pointing off towards, that's like the direction we're sampling. So that's basically like our sample direction. Uh, we have the normal. I guess I'll just call it normal. Uh, and then we have here, um, this is our, uh, I guess that's, that's that's incorrect. So this is our, what do they, we call this? This is the view dir, and this is the light direction, right? So that's that's sort of what their nomenclature was, like where the light's coming from, where the view is. And so if we go back now um, and look at how this is coming in, we need to know these values. So we need to know theta in uh, and phi in, and theta out and phi out. And then this does sort of the conversion to their uh, sampling. So we're gonna have to reproduce that to look it up uh, in their table. But first we have to produce those um, angles at all, right? And so this is why I say this is gonna be very expensive and bad, um, like really terrible. And we're probably gonna have to like do our own implementation of ACOS or something here, right? Uh, but if we go look at how, uh, where was the diagram? Here it is. So if we look at what this is uh, giving us for parameters, what we have here is there's like, um, there's the normal versus, so, so if we look at, look at this diagram basically, right? And this is the standard coordinate frame. So if we look at, you know, and I guess I don't know which way we want to do this, but if we look at these two pieces of code side by side. Um, so if we look at this, this is taking in the theta in phi in, oops. So this is theta in and phi in. So those, those two are very simple for us to understand because that they don't encode anything, right? And then we've got here a theta out and a phi out. And again, very simple to understand because they're just the polar coordinates of these two values. If you look over here, um, in terms of what those are, these are versus the half angle, right? And uh, the half angle, I guess, is... is I, I assume it's it's defined as being... Well, you know what? I can't really tell. What is what is the half angle actually half of? Uh, let me take a look. Specifically, we vary h the angle between the normal and the half vector, right? Um, just double check what they think the half vector is. Of course, it doesn't look like anyone says what the half vector is here. Sorry, half dash vector. The angles with respect to the half angle, half vector between incoming and outgoing directions. Okay, that's pretty easy for us to produce, right? So looking at this, it's unclear, like we may just wanna produce this directly because it doesn't look like, I mean, this isn't any easier to produce than this if all you have is the vectors, really. So it feels like we should kind of just go directly to this. Right, like we should just we should just compute these direct these directly, in my opinion. So in order to do that, we would just first do the half vector, right? This thing they call the half vector, uh, and the incoming and outgoming, we would just do view dir plus light dir, 
multiplied by 0.5, right? I mean, that's all we would really need to do. Um, and that produces the half vector. So that's the H here, right? Uh, and then if we wanted to start figuring out what the angles are between these two things, well, one of our problems is these two are normalized, but this is not normalized, right? So we're going to have to think about that a little bit. But if we take a look at what's going on here and we just say like, all right, so the angles we need are uh, theta H, theta D, phi D, and phi H. Do those correspond to something in here? Uh, and looking, it looks like theta diff, theta half, so standard chords to half diff chords, theta half, phi half, theta half, phi half, and then diff, yeah. So it looks like once we know those, we can look this up directly, and you can see that here. Um, we have to look at, kind of see if what they're doing with, with these, phi diff index and theta diff index. Um, so theta diff index looks like it's, it's looks to me like mostly just clamping, right? Uh, and, and mapping the angle out to the resolution, resolution of the table. So those seem fairly straightforward, uh, and easy to reproduce. Like th there's not anything mysterious going on there. So really it seems like all we have to do is focus on producing these, right? Uh, and so let's just try to reproduce those. So in order to reproduce those, what we need is we need uh, theta half and phi half, and then we need uh, theta diff and phi diff. That's how they want us to produce the encoding, right? And then from those, we need to do this mapping on each of them, uh, and and off we would go, right? Then we can actually look up in the table. Uh, all right, so in, in order to produce these, what we're looking for here is just the A cost basically of this thing uh, in this reference frame. And one of the problems that we're gonna have here is we don't really know what the tangent actually is. And the problem is that we do kind of need to know that because in order to, uh, properly like orient these things there has to be a direction uh, of the surface right the reason for that is because surfaces that are well surfaces that are isotropic meaning they reflect light the same regardless of rotation don't care like they wouldn't care what this is because the function that we're looking up would be symmetric to no, you would wouldn't matter how you spun the surface um, but for anisotropic surfaces they reflect light differently depending on the orientation of the surface right and so we would need a tangent frame here as well in order to measure things like phi h. Because uh, that's in this plane. So things like theta h, like theta h here, we don't care what, you know, it doesn't matter, right, what the orientation of the surface is for theta h. Uh, and for theta d, probably the same thing. But for the two phi's, right, uh, it feels like those are going to be ones that, in order to measure them properly, uh, we would need to to have the tangent frame, right? I mean, as far as I can tell, that, that'd be the only way you could actually do it, right? Uh, and, and looking at this, right, um, what is this stuff for? So you can see them actually doing it here, right? Um, which is kind of weird. So it's interesting, the way they were actually doing the lookup here is they were saying, well, you didn't give us vectors, you gave us the original angles, which you probably had to do a bunch of work to measure. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna immediately turn them back into vectors, right? Because we need to take the half angle, which they did. And for some reason, they normalized both of these, even though they didn't need to, because they were going to normalize this. I don't know why, but that's just what they did, right? Um, and then once they took these, you can see, like exactly like I said, they basically take an a cos of the half angle vector and an a tan uh, for of the other two parts of it uh, to produce. Um, uh, 
right, to produce the the um, the values they want. And this assumes that you've already mapped it into the tangent space, right? Because these are already relative to the tangent space. Uh, so yeah, so it seems like mostly what we need to be able to do here, and what we don't what we don't really have, is we need to be able to provide a tangent space, um, which I'm honestly not sure how we would do. Uh, for uh, pretty much what we'd have to do is when we do our collision um and we produce the normal so like if you if we look down here when we produce the normal uh we're going to also have to produce a tangent right um and what we could do is change the name here normal and tangent like so uh, and so when we go in over to to the normals here i guess i can just do a search and replace Uh, so we'll just call that normal, like so. And then we also have tangent. And so tangent will uh, give us the ability to do that mapping, right? If we have the normal and the tangent, we can do the mapping. Now, since we generally are going to also, we're going to know uh, m more than that as well. Like we can probably also know the normal, the tangent, and the, the bi-tangent, like the, the thing that completes that coordinate frame and makes this an actual like basis right um i'm trying to think if we need that i think we do because we're you know we're probably going to want to do this right uh and that way when we come through here and we say okay like let's conditionally assign these to normal tangent by tangent um like this and uh same thing on the sphere So the normal here, sphere relative ray origin. Yeah, you can see. So that produces the uh, the the hit for the sphere. The thing that's going to be tough for us, right, is producing the normal. Um, yeah. So, right, loading up the plane normal, it becomes pretty easy because the plane itself can just store the other parts that it needs. So in the plane, right, when we define our planes, uh, we can just also store like three things, the tangent and the bi vector, right? The bi tangent. I could name these a little bit more explicitly here. So if we said normal, uh, then in this case, we could also just, if we actually uh, hit these, then we could just load the other ones in. Maybe I'll load them all. Right. So if we load those in and I do my conditional assignment, then I would have everything I would need to do the full mapping. Uh, and in the case where I have a sphere, it's a much harder problem because we don't really know how to produce uh, the other values. And if we go over to, um, let me just grab my sketch pad here. So if we're looking at uh, a sphere, the problem we're going to have is, okay, so we know we hit this point on the sphere. We know the normal is just the vector from the center of the sphere to the outside of the sphere because that's, you know, the surface normal at that point. So that gives us a situation where we sort of have, you know, you imagine this is the surface of the sphere up close at that point. That gives us a situation where we know the normal but what we need is another basis, right? Something that's going to give us like, you know, something like this that we can actually use as like, this is the coordinate system of the sphere. And so you can see why I'm like, I don't really know exactly how to do that, especially because spheres by definition can't have one, right? Like a sphere cannot have a coordinate system, a two-dimensional coordinate system assigned to them. It's uh, mathematically impossible to do, um, you by definition uh, will have a pole somewhere, 
right? Uh, the phrase you might hear sometimes is you cannot comb the hair on a cue ball. Uh, you cannot pet a spherical cat might be another one. Uh, Oh, there we go. Spherical cow. <laughs> uh... <laughs> um, that is not what I meant, uh, but that is great. Uh, that, that's all right so this is the one i actually wanted the hairy ball theorem <laughs> which is, who, who names these things the hairy ball theorem uh the point of the hairy ball theorem is just yeah it's it's the example um so a torus right on a torus you can assign a field you know a, a two-dimensional uh grid and it works properly. There's no anomalies anywhere, no singularities. Um, you can see if you try to do it on a sphere, you always end up with some problems, right? Uh, where you're going to have at least one pole, right? I like that there's actually a human head in the Wikipedia page. Uh, yeah, um, this is this is like what I was trying to say. So the problem that we have <laughs> due to the hairy ball theorem um, is that we don't have a way of assigning something uniform. Now, that's okay. We don't mind if we have some singularities, right? This is just an example ray tracer. So, you know, what we need to do is come up with something that will give us a coordinate system we can actually use. Uh, sorry to bump the microphone there. And so what we might do is say, well, okay, you know, maybe we just use whatever would be the lateral, like whatever would be the cross product of that and like the up vector, right? Um, and in the case where we actually are looking directly at the up vector, we'll just get, that will be our pole and that'll be degenerate, right? I mean, that's one thing we can do. Um, another thing we could do is try to just generate an ortho orthogonal basis using some other scheme. Uh, I'm not sure what it should be, uh, but you know, we can certainly work it out. So I'm going to just say, all right, let's suppose that we're just going to do some kind of a, of a, um, uh, you know, generation of a basis here. That's just kind of garbage, but we'll just produce it either way. So I'm going to go ahead and say that we're going to do a cross product. Um, of our normal to produce our tangent and then we're going to do a conditional assign like this uh, and so I'm going to cross the normal with I don't know just the up vector to generate um, one and then I'm going to take the cross product again. So basically like whatever the normal is and the up vector, I'm gonna cross those two. I really should cross them in the other order probably right hand rule wise. I probably wanna cross the up vector with the normal um, like so, right? Cause the normal Z and this would be uh, Y. Or I guess the normal would be X, this would be Y. What do we want the normal to be? I guess technically the normal is Z actually. So I want my X, my Y, and my Z. So if my Y was sort of the up vector at this point, I would want Y, yeah, to get the uh, X. So the tangent vector would be X, the bitangent vector would be uh, Y in this case, okay. So if I get my tangent vector out, uh, then what I wanna do is cross from the normal back to the sphere tangent uh, to get my uh, other basis, and then these just need to be normalized, right? Right? 
Um, do I need to do anything else to that? I think that should be sufficient. Um, so that will give me a tangent and a bi-tangent. What that means is that now I can map these things into the space of the actual reflection uh, completely. So, you know, when these things get passed in here, uh, I can do that mapping. So what I'm going to do is, is say I'm going to pass the full coordinate system here. So I'm going to do normal tangent bi-tangent. And then the BRDF lookup, I'm going to go ahead and pass those in. So normal tangent, oops. By tangent, like so. Uh, and then what I need to do is actually do this mapping. So in order to produce uh, these two vectors mapped in, I need to do basically a transform on them using the three vectors that I have, um, you know, the normal tangent and by tangent. I want to map into that space, which is, 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 you know, just taking the inner product with each of them to put them into that space. So if I want to now, I can, I can basically do that uh, that transform. So that would just look like, all right, uh, my, you know, my viewer and my elder vectors, right, which I'll just call V and L here. Oh, you know what? I guess I can take the half vector first and just map the half vector in if I want to as well. Um, I'm not sure which order you would do those in necessarily. Right, we need to produce the half vector and then we could map the half vector in if we want to, I guess. And how, wait, so what do we, what do we actually need here? Just wanna make sure. Uh, so yeah. So to compute the diff vector, they're doing a rotation. What are they doing for that? Let me look back at what they're actually trying to grab there. So looking at this, they want to do the difference, the diff, I don't know what they want to do. So they want to do the theta D between H and, and omega here. And they want to do the phi D, which I assume is, I'm just the thing I'm not sure about is this diagram sucks. Like this part right here, I have no idea what they're trying to measure. I guess they're trying to measure if I had a vector that was that was perpendicular here to H, I would be measuring the rotation of that to point towards this vector. I guess. Like I really just do not know what this is supposed to measure. Um, it's pretty confusing, right? Um, this one is not confusing to me. So these are just the polar coordinates of H. And that's really easy to understand. But what this is, I don't, I don't quite get, right? Um, and I guess maybe I should be looking this up. Right, because maybe that, that's explained in more detail there. But that's the only part I don't really get, is like what what that one measurement is supposed to be. Um, but either way, we can start. Uh, so theta half and phi half, those are, are pretty easy, right? One's an A cos and one's an A tan too, right? Uh, and in order to figure these out, we just need the X and Y. So A tan two is like Y X usually, right? And so we would we will know what those two are once we actually map uh, the half vector in, right? So if I map the half vector into that space and it's the outgoing direction, so we need L and H, right? So once we map the half vector into that space, this would just be H dot Y and this would be H dot X, right? And this would be the A cos of H dot Z. Right, so those are the ways that we would measure, we would sort of map those out, right? Now, we don't really want to have to take, for rather obvious reasons, acoses and a tans in this way, 
Um, like we would rather not have to do that, obviously. Uh, but at the moment, we're kind of stuck with that. So we'll have to figure out what we want to do with that uh, a little bit later. And probably what we'll need to do there is downshift, right? We'll probably have to do this for now. I don't know where the gather functions are. Uh, they are, there we go. Uh, so yeah, so for like the gather functions here in order to extract this stuff, uh, we need some way of pulling out the individual values. So like we need, to do something like this, right? And then we need to like extract the values out. So we need to do um, like this, right? Extract zero is, we really want extract N, right? So we want something that's gonna do like this. Uh, and then we're probably fine. But anyway, so over here we've got our LW and our HW, right? And those are our wide versions of these vectors. So the first things that we need to do there are we need to take uh, the, the LW and the HW are just gonna be mappings into this space, space of the vectors. So to map the half vector in, it's really pretty easy, right? It's just an inner product uh, in this case. I assume, so if I do a V3, oops, uh, how do I load a V3 with actual results? I don't actually know. Oh, well, you know what? I can do it this way. I think. Assuming this actually is the way I think it is. Yeah, so it's just three F32s. So I can just do it this way. So I can just produce the inner product, right? Uh, of the light direction uh, with each of the, the pieces. So we know that the tangent is our X, the bi-tangent is our Y, and the normal is our Z. So this makes a little coordinate frame. And by taking the inner product of the light direction with each of the pieces of our coordinate frame, I end up with the transformed vector. And the same would be true of this, right? And so this is just really doing a matrix transform on it, right? <clears throat> without bothering to ever build an actual matrix, because why bother? <clears throat> so this maps them into the space, <clears throat> the tangent space of the reflection. Uh, and then this produces the values we actually need. The theta half is the ACOS of whatever the Z value would be and the ATAN two in this case, right? Um, and so then the only question is how the heck do we compute these things? Because I have no idea what they are, right? Now, one of them, I'm pretty sure I know what it is. Uh, and I can compute that one pretty easily. Again, I'm sort of just guessing, but where's that? There it is. Um, so if you take a look at the, what this looks like here, I'm pretty sure that theta D is just going to, is just the separation between these two, right? So it's the angle of separation between the two vectors. That looks like what they drew, right? I don't know, but it looks like what they drew. Um, and so if that's the actual case, then that's a really easy one to do because again, it's just an A cos, but it's the A cos of the inner product of the two vectors, right? So for example, Here's the inner product of the half vector um, with the uh, light direction, right? Or is that supposed to be the outgoing direction? No, that's the incoming direction, right? So if we take it with the incoming direction there, why would this, well, I don't care. Um, so yeah, if we just take it with the income, the, the LW here that we've produced, I guess it's technically these two, right? Um, although it doesn't matter, I could have done it beforehand. So actually, I don't even know why we would need, I, 
I guess I don't even know why we would really need uh, to do this transform, but we'll take a look at that later, I guess. So the diff the inner product difference here, right, those two, that is specifically what we would take the A cos of, right? Um, and so if I want to do an extract on that, That would be the theta that we need for that lookup. And then the phi that we would need, right, in this case, that's the one I just don't know what it is. I don't know what that's supposed to be telling me, right? And their implementation is pretty confusing. They're doing a complete, like, huge set of, of things here to, to solve it. Uh, and again, I don't really know what they're trying to produce there. So they are taking a rotation of a vector, the in direction, and the normal. And why would they be using the, oh, right, because the in direction is what we're talking about. So that's the light vector. And the normal minus phi half. So that's the input here, right? Uh, they're rotating the opposite direction into a temp vector. Then they're rotating that vector by the binormal by theta half into the diff vector and then producing that. Okay. I sort of get it, maybe. So I think what they're sort of trying to do, yikes, just trying to figure out, this is just really, this is ter this is like a horrible diagram. I should also look to see wh what is the 1998 Rusinkowitz. So here's the same incredibly terrible diagram, right? Uh, but at least the phi's are easier to read now. Change of variables will cause some features of common bearer to still lie along the new coordinates. This we propose parameter of the bearer in terms of the halfway vector and a difference vector, which is just the incident ray in a frame of reference in which the halfway vector is at the North Pole. Okay, so that is exactly what I thought, um, but I'm not sure. The, the problem is that's underspecified, right? Because there's any amount of rotation, you know, y you could have any amount of rotation you wanted there, right? Does that make sense? Surface normal, surface tangent, surface binormal. Should probably call it the binormal so the bitangent if that's the phrase we're using. All right, 
What's the problem here? Oh, these are not RGB anymore. Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, so figuring this out is going to be a little bit weird. So how would I normally do this? I'm trying to think. Um, trying to think of how I would produce that efficiently. I don't think the way they're doing it is particularly good. Um, I mean, I think a lot of this is not particularly good and not how I would necessarily do it, but that's sort of beside the point. So let's look at the diagram. So essentially, here's what we're trying to do. We have a coordinate frame, right? And the coordinate frame looks like this. Right. So we essentially have a coordinate frame that's the normal vector to the surface, the tangent vector to the surface, and the binormal. And these form our x, y, and z, respectively. You know, if we think of this as a standard coordinate frame. And this is on the surface of something, like on the surface of the sphere, right? What we have is a uh, half vector that we've produced, and we've mapped it into this frame. So it's just sitting in here, right? And that's our half vector. And then we have another vector, which is like our light vector, right? And what we want to do is we want to say, what would the coordinates of this thing be in polar coordinates if this were actually the new z vector, right? So if we rotated this up to here, you know what I'm saying? What would this be? at that point what would what would we consider this to be at that once we got there right so th this whole thing were kind of shifted up and this became the new bottom right and so if we looked at this in 2d instead like to make it a little bit easier to understand for those of you watching If we did something like this, where here's a normal, here's the half vector, here's the light vector, right? So here's the tangent down here. What we're looking to do is say, let's pretend this were actually the coordinate system, right? So now everything is relative to this. We're like rotating it into place. And in 2D, this would just work because we wouldn't really have to care because we could just measure it directly. But in 3D, we actually do care because we need to be able to do this on the actual hemisphere. So the whole thing has to come up and we need to know like what the displacement, what the polar coordinates think of this thing are. That's why I say we can just take the inner product to quickly get one of them, right? Which is the, oops, sorry. Which is the theta uh, diff, right? That we can just get directly by taking the uh, arc cosine of the inner product. That's trivial. Uh, the thing we can't really do, um, is quickly take the other part of it. And the reason for that is because that part of it uh, requires actual other basis vectors. The question is, is there some way we could easily generate those basis vectors, right? And that part, I don't know. Since we don't know how the half angle vector actually, we, well, so we know the actual half angle vector angles.
And that's why they're doing that rotation. I'm just not sure, yeah. So you can see the way that they're trying to do it. Uh, if we go back to their source code, right? So the, the way that they're doing it is saying, well, all right, I know I do have the half angle vector that I, I actually computed, right? So this is the winding, this, this is the rotation of it in the plane of the tangent. Like, so that's this right here, this phi half, that's the winding in this space of the half angle vector. So if you map the half angle vector down to like here, I guess let's pretend it's in the positive side. So here's the plane that it's in, right? We, ma uh, we map that down to like here. And we just say, look, we've already measured this part. That's the theta half. What's this part, right? This part here. That gives us the, the phi half, right? So what they're saying is, let's spin this vector back around. Let's spin it, right, so that it lines up exactly here, right? So we're going to move it back to, like, there, right? And then what they're going to do is take that vector at that point, right, uh, and rotate uh, it around the binormal, so around this, and you can see why, because they rotated it into this plane. So now they're going to try to rotate it this way. They're going to rotate it up there, right? If that makes sense. Um, and so what they're effectively doing is they're taking this vector, they're performing the rotation on this vector that would rotate it such that the H would now have been pointing directly up. So this makes perfect sense now. It's just, man, is that expensive, right? Like, producing that is kind of nuts. Um, mm, let me put on my thinking cap here for a second. There's got to be a better way to do that. So the first thing we know is that if we were going to rotate that thing just once to put it into position, we could have done that. And they didn't do that. And I'm wondering if that's because it won't produce the correct uh, the correct actual transform. Because this, you know, just bear with me for a second here. So let's suppose that we have the surface normal here. We've got the half angle. I'm sorry, the half vector here. Uh, and then we've got, you know, tangent and by tangent. And I say, look, I just want to rotate this up into place. Well, I already know this angle, right? I know what that angle actually is because that's my, my theta half, right? I mean, isn't that what that was? Um, let me double check that I'm not making that up. I mean, we could find it trivially even if it's not, but I just want to make sure I remember what we're actually measuring here. Yeah. So we know that angle, right? And so the question is, what is the rotation? If I just want to do one single rotation to put this back into place, what would it be? Well, theta half would just be, you know, the cross product of n and h, right? n cross h gives me this vector, Right, And then if I rotate by this much, it would put it into place in one rotation, not two. Right. So if I did want to rotate L into place, I could just do that one rotation, and that would have put L into the place that it should, should actually be. Right? I mean, that's just kind of by definition. The question is, 
are they trying to take something that's not, are they intentionally not taking the shortest path? Are they intentionally doing those two rotations for some other reason because they want the winding, they want the spin in this place to have some specific measurement, right? Um, and that's the part that I'm having trouble, a little bit of a hard time figuring out because the way that they're applying the rotation is rather than this rotate directly, they are first rotating into the plane of the tangent. So they're first rotating here and then rotating there. And I don't know that that, that probably would produce a slightly different uh, spin so that as you were going up here, you were actually spinning a little as well, right? Because remember, the route that you take to move H into N, so the route along the sphere, will produce different spin this way, right, around the normal. And it looks like they are doing a different one. I don't know why they're doing that one. It seems dumb uh, to do that because it wouldn't matter which way you've encoded this, would it? I mean, since the anisotropy of the surface is the thing that you're actually measuring, it seems crazy to do this coordinate system because this coordinate system is just more operations. Instead of just doing a single rotation, now you have to do two. And that seems really stupid. Um, I mean, am I wrong? I don't suppose uh, uh, Rizinkowicz is watching the stream right now and can tell me whether whether I'm wrong about his coordinate system being less efficient than it should be, right? Uh, but that seems that seems busted. If we assumed temporarily that we could use that we could do this direct rotation, um. Then what we would say is, well, okay, so if we now need to measure the spin relative to this vector of the L vector, which is sitting somewhere in this space, right? What we want to know is the inner product of that on this coordinate system. Because we don't actually need to rotate the vector if we can just get these vectors directly, right? And of course we can get these vectors directly because these vectors are just the half angle cross producted with the normal, which gives us this one, right? And then we would just do the cross product again with the H and that vector to give us this one. The inner product on each of those gives us the result. That means no transcendentals, right? Ugh, it's too hard to say. Let's say no sine cosine, right? Um, so I feel like that's actually better anyway. I'm just gonna say that's what we should do. And if we want to, oh, actually, oh yeah, you know what? We could even do this the way they're doing it. Because if you were going to first rotate into this plane, then rotate into this plane, you can probably still do that, can't you? Because you would just go versus the tangent first. So you'd do H cross T, which would get you, which would get you this vector. And then you would cross the two to get the other one. So I think you can actually do that if you want T to be the prevailing thing that you'd rotate it to first. I think you could just cross those two. So I think we could do that. I think we just do H cross T and I think we can just do this in a way that's way better than what they were doing. Like way better, not like a little bit. Uh, I really want to be able to draw this out. Unfortunately, I don't have any, like, diagramming stuff in here, but, like, I mean, I want to be able to, like, draw this, like, you know, in the editor of the future, you'll be able to just, like, see the the things on the side. So as you change the formula in here, it would just draw it, you know? But, yeah. You know.
Let's not ask for miracles, folks. Uh, so anyway, if you wanted to in here, right, I could just go, all right, let's create that coordinate system as well and just produce it. And we can produce it wide. We don't have to downshift for that, which is great. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to produce those uh, those other basis vectors here. So I'm going to call that like uh, diff x and diff y, I guess. And these are the things that we would measure those uh, against. Um, and then when I want to uh, produce the actual uh, results, it's much easier, right? I can just do the ACOS um, on this x, uh, this x and y inner, right? Um, so it'd, it'd just be this. Right, so we do the uh, the half uh, vector with the, the LW, and then we would just do the the you know the diff x and the diff y um, with the half vect with the uh, light vector, and I think that produces everything we need. And these again are just cross products; it's not complicated, right? Uh, so the diff x is just going to be, let's take, uh, that's just going to be take the half vector. Um, and I just need to get the winding right here. So where's my diagram? Yeah, so take the half vector and the tangent. Uh, I want to produce a standard coordinate frame where this is going to be the n. And so in order to produce the x, what would I want to do? Uh, well, I'm actually going to end up producing the Y because the T is going to be this. So I would just do the cross product of H down to T like this, right? Um, and then after I've produced the H down to T version, then I just need to do, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the recross of that. Uh, and so the H down to T version, then I would do the that up to H to get the T back. Right. Uh, and these are backwards now. Right. So I think that gives me everything I need. If I then do my ex extraction here, uh, this is all now, I think, uh, all sort of done properly. Those are all measured. The inner products are all taken. Um, I'm trying to think of why this one, this isn't exactly, like I don't really need these to be, I guess it doesn't really matter which which one I'm doing this, but the half vector here is, is HW. Uh, they don't really need to be mapped into that coordinate space though, right? It That wouldn't really matter, um, I don't think. Because it's, you know, it is the space that it is. So that, it, it, why I, mm, it, it doesn't matter that it's in this coordinate space. I think that's kind of dumb that I do that, but we can work out simplifications like that a little bit later. Uh, anyway, let's see. So diff y here, uh, hw here. And then in here where we do this, now we just, this is an a cost and this is an a tan too. Uh, and in this case, it's just the extract of that diff x inner. So it's just like extract diff x inner. Uh, Subindex extract diff x inner subindex. So this would just be y over x. This is extract diff z inner, like so. I'm trying to think if there's anything weird happening here. So this part here, the hz, hy, hx. Again, I don't think since those are just this. This doesn't actually have to happen this way either. So the theta half we can just do extract. Subindex, extract, subindex, extract, subindex, and these are just going to be the half vector, right? 
So I think that's everything we need from there. Uh, and then we just need that one extract function. So if I actually look at what the extract zero, uh, what we actually need here is just something that'll do this. Right, uh, and I think this probably needs to be a pound defined because that's going to be an actual immediate. I, I I would suspect so. It probably needs to be like this. Right, and then we're going to have to have like an m convert, like uh, one of those things where you extract the actual value. Uh, there. I I don't remember what they are because I never remember. Um, the Intel intrinsics are so crazy. Uh, the naming scheme is just nuts. But this. So basically, we can just pass which one of these we want. Uh, so I believe we can just do that. The problem is again, it's not a variable. Right, it has to be a constant, uh, and so it's kind of a pain in the butt because we want this uh, we want this to be able to give us something that um, we don't have to produce a loop for, you know, ideally. Um, so that part's kind of annoying because um, I'd have to wrap this in a macro. Or something, uh, and it, it's just because we don't have implementations of ACOS and ATAN2 yet. Uh, we need those to be wide, and so the downshifting here is, you know, it's, it's obviously like really bad, uh, and not at all what we want. But I'm not really sure how to get around that without implementing these two, which would take many days of work, right? Um, so we don't have much of a choice of that. Uh, oh, I say many days of work. I mean many streams of work. Uh, so anyway, that's a bit of a problem, and I'm not sure how to really get around that. We could try using an one where we actually extract based on a variable, but those are much harder to come by. Um, so maybe we'll just do something really crappy right now for the time being and actually just access off of the you know, uh, off of it this way, right? Which is again, not, not good and not really what we want to do. Um, but it's, I think it's the best we're going to be able to get since we're already probably should ri wind up pretty soon. There we go. Um, so let's see. This right here is just gonna return a double because that's how, oh, well, you know what? No, they have they have float versions in the C runtime library, right? Don't they? Yeah. All right, so let's just finish it up so we can close up for the day. For each of these, we're gonna have to do the lookup again slowly. And then we're going to have uh, the return value, which is going to be what we actually get out of the BRDF when we combine it. So there's like a result here, right? Uh, and that's what we're going to return. And so what we want to do there is we need to be able to like pack stuff into this thing. So basically like uh, when, we, when we do the gather here, we're going to have to do like a result. You know, the X is going to be this, the Y is going to be this, the Z is going to be this kind of a thing, right? So we're going to have like a color value that we actually look up here. Uh, and then we're going to have, we're going to have to put that back in somehow, right? Um, and presumably we'll have to do it like, I don't know, if there's an, is this an insert here? Uh, gather F32, gather F32, there we go. Um, nope, it's not what I wanted. Yeah. Um, so 
So wait a minute. How is that working? Index times stride. Lane U32 index plus base pointer. What? How can you multiply a wide index by a stride and load an F32 off of it? What? How is this even compiling? Anyone care to tell me? That makes like no sense to me. So like the lane operator two star. I do I do not know how that's even remotely legal, right? This is supposed to be wide, isn't it? Oh. Oh, okay. I see what we're saying. <laughs> Never mind. That's the part we did. We did a version for non wide. <laughs> so, <laughs> Never mind. Not, uh, that's not as scary. There we go. That's what I wanted to see. All right. Totally fine. No worries. Everything's fine. Uh, right. Okay. So anyway, uh, if I wanted to do this here, again, this is really crappy and we don't really want to do it this way. What we want to do is just do this wide so that the whole thing is just, you know, these, these, we want to have wide versions of these. And then we only want to have to do the lookup, just, just that part. Uh, obviously we, we can't quite do, uh, correctly, but I guess, you know, what I can do too is this, um, lane V3 here. What I could do is, is use this gather, um, uh, and, 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 you know, do it this way, right? So I could do something like this where we do a gather F32 uh, on each of these. And then the result is just that, right? I mean, another way to look at it would be I could just do this. Uh, and this way, if we do a base pointer plus a stride uh, with the indices like this, what we could do is then we'll just build, you know, whatever these indices are. We can build those and then let this gather for us. That's one way to do it. Uh, the problem is we're still going to have to pack the indices. So I guess I don't really know that that saves us much. Um, uh, you know, kind of six of one half dozen of the other. So I don't know. This is the old, this is the problem with uh, pre-AVX 512 SIMD. Intel never bothered to give you a way to load anything. So it was, you know, kind of a, kind of a lost cause. But anyway, so if we want to load like table lookup, right? They didn't implement table lookup for some reason. So anyway, inside here, if we actually assume like, okay, we'll, we'll just make this work the other way around. Uh, then what we can do is say, well, all right, result.x, uh, what we'll have to do is like address off of that, right, like this, and place these values in there uh, using each individual sublane, right? So this would look like this. Uh, and then we would just assign them like that. So that way we can assign the colors in here and that way this thing can look up just regular. So in the BRDF table uh, for whatever material we're talking about, so like materials, and I don't know how these are being extracted here. I guess they just get extracted that way. Yeah, a lot of this is just so, so ugly, you know. Uh, so anyway, if we go ahead and grab this particular material index out um, and get the BRDF table.
Uh, <clears throat> maybe I'll do it this way. Uh, then what we need to do is take a look at those values here. Um, and then <clears throat> uh, this is going to give me the value that I actually want. So if I look it up in the table here, the question is, what's the actual index, right? So I know that the index is going to be proportional to these things when we get these values out, uh, but I know I need to map them in. So I've got an index here. Uh, and what we need to do, we probably want to do an assertion, right, that says, uh, I don't know if we've been asserting anywhere in here. Yeah. Uh, so we probably want to do an assertion that makes sure that we're not out of bounds, right? So that just so we have some idea of whether or not this thing is, is you know, totally nuts or something. But so like right here, I can assert um, that whatever index value we want, let's just assert that it's uh, within the, the bounds of this thing. So that'll just make sure we know. Oops. Uh, that we're not going to fetch outside of the table. And then what we need to do is actually figure out what our index in the table actually is. And this is the last step to the process. So we've got all of our angles here. This is everything they wanted from us, right? In order to actually use one of these BRDF files. Uh, and then, you know, they've got the way that they're mapping it in here. Uh, and you can see that right in here. So you can see the way they've mapped it in. They want to clamp it so that if the uh, theta is less than zero, um, that means it's more than 90 degrees. So they're just saying, look, if it's more than 90 degrees, we don't do it, right? Uh, and that seems fine. So we can do like theta half less than zero, theta half equals zero, right? Totally fine. Then they're doing like, all right, what's the half degree? So they basically try to take, they divide by pi over two, right? Which is 90 degrees. So they're dividing by 90 degrees and then multiplying by whatever the sampling resolution actually is, right? Um, That seems fine. They're literally just mapping the range of zero to pi over two to the range of the array, right? Um, so what I might propose is like saying something like this, like let's call that I zero. Let's take theta half and divide by pi 32, uh, half pi 32. So we've, we've converted it this way. And then let's just clamp zero one that. Cause now that's given us our exact range, uh, right? Of lookups. And then what we can do is just map that into the sampling resolution to get our index, right? Uh, so maybe the right way to do it would be this way, right? So do the rounding, uh, take that dimension, multiply it in. Uh, although actually we don't really want to round, right? We want to truncate actually. So we really just want this. So we want to take our table uh, and that first count, we want to multiply like so. Uh, and that might overfetch if we literally got right up to 90. So what we may want to do is say, all right, maybe we do it this way where we, I don't know what the mapping should actually be. If you look at how they're doing the mapping here, it's a little bit squinky. Like it seems like theta half degree there, it looks like, it looks like they clamp after the fact, right? Um, and I'm not sure if that really makes sense. Uh, I suspect, suspect it might not. You know what I'm saying to you? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure. So I think what we might want to do is say, all right, if we did it this way and then did a round, so we did that, I think that's probably the right way to do that mapping, I'm guessing. Uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, but 
probably something like that, right? Uh, we then need to do another one because again, we've got so many of these parameters coming in here. So uh, that's having there. Oh, and you can see here they're doing some other things here, right? Uh, then they're saying, well, okay, whatever that half degree is, we're going to multiply it by uh, the res. Wait, what? So they then square it and then square root. What? Why? Uh, anybody know? What is that about? I have no idea what that's about. Divide by 90 degrees. Multiply by the resolution. So now you've mapped it all the way out. Multiply by the resolution again, then square root it? Are they just trying to get more resolution in a particular s part of the sampling range? Yeah, they are. That's exactly what they're doing. But that's not correct. If you wanted to do that, you would have to have squared it beforehand. Right? That doesn't distribute. This, this can't be right, can it? Am I nuts there? I mean, if you look at this, this seems totally wrong. Because you've taken theta half, which is the thing you wanted to map non-linearly, and you've multiplied it by the actual table size. Then you're multiplying by the table size again and then square rooting. This thing... That only square roots half of the part. I don't think this is right. Is there a bug in this code? Because, you know, I mean, just, just think of it this way, right? This is the value that we want to map non-linearly, right? It's this. And we want to square root that, right? But the problem is they've done that after already multiplying it by the table count. And you can't distribute that that doesn't work, right? I mean, just do the multiplication. I mean, here. If you don't believe me, maybe I'm just nuts, but here. So let's suppose that we take this at face value. So we've got theta half over m pi uh, over two, right? So what that's gonna do is that's gonna produce a value from zero to one, right? Because we've got something that can only go up to 90 degrees. We're going to uh, divide it by 90 degrees, and then we're gonna get a value from zero to one that we're gonna use to range map into this thing, right? So we're going to call that our t value, basically, right? If we then say t times the sampling res theta h, right? So now we've got t times the resolution. We assign that to theta half, theta half deg, right? And then we do uh, temp equals theta half deg times that, right? So that's this value again. So that makes this t times r squared, right? I mean, that's what that would do. We then square root that. So we're square rooting, and this is the actual index value we then use. So we're square rooting t times r squared, right? That gives us i equals r times root t, right? Is that right? All right, well, never mind. I take it back. That's actually fine, it's just very convoluted because you didn't need to do it. So the math does check out. It's just, again, very inefficient, I guess, because you didn't need to do any of that. You could have just square rooted this and then multiplied it, right? So I guess the math does check out now that I've worked it through, but 
why would you do it? Might be the better way to say it. Yeah. Because it's just this, right? I don't know where our square root is. It's right there. So that's all you really need to do. Like so. So this is our F0, and then we just need to basically multiply it by that, and then, you know, off we go. So it's just they did an extra multiply, and I just don't know why. Again, it, it doesn't really make sense. But it wasn't really, they weren't really trying to be efficient in that code, probably, so maybe they just didn't care. But it just seems like a really convoluted way to do it. So anyway, they want this to be a nonlinear mapping. <clears throat> That's fine. We can make it a nonlinear mapping. However, at that point, why did we take the ACOS? If we wanted a nonlinear mapping, just don't take the ACOS. Just use the inner product, right? And then we would have had the nonlinear mapping, I think. So that's also pretty weird, right? Like, I feel like this is actually just undoing what the A cosine did. So again, pretty weird, not really sure what's going on there. If you look at what's going on now, um, just trying to figure out where we're getting here. So we have our theta half index, as you can see, uh, sorry, here, right, uh, that we're using for our index. We've got our phi diff index and our theta diff index, right? Um, So looking at this, we don't really need the phi half. We just need phi diff and then these two, right? So this is actually unnecessary. We only need the HWZ, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So anyway, then we come in here and we do uh, theta half index is the one we've got. Theta diff index is theta diff, and phi diff index is phi diff. So we got to look at those. So theta diff index is not uh, nonlinear. So that's literally just mapping it directly into the resolution. So dividing by 90 and going. Uh, and then it's clamped to the table size, right? And if we look at how they've defined that, uh, Theta diff is the same, so it's also a half angle. So basically, it's the exact same code just without the nonlinear mapping, right? So if we want to, we can do this exactly the same way we did it. We just don't square root it. Right? So again, pretty easy. And so then the final one is the only one that's probably more complicated. Don't ask me why I didn't change that to a one. And I also have to look at how those are stratted out. But uh, so if we look here at phi diff index, theta diff index, theta half index, uh, it looks like this phi diff index one uh, here's the reciprocity. So this is just basically saying, look, we're going to make it be symmetric about pi, right? So basically they're just doing, you know, a, uh, a bump up. So when we look in here and we look at the phi diff, uh, and we're, you know, we did the a tan two here, we're going to say, uh, if phi diff is less than zero, phi diff plus equals pi 32, right? And that's all that's doing. So then here, it looks like we multiply out by the sampling again, uh, and off we go. And I guess this resolution value is actually sort of garbage. Um, that's a one, by the way, right? Theta half, theta d, and so phi d is here. 
So we want half of this value, but that's what we're actually gonna get in the count, right? Because according to this, they stored that in the file halved, right? So the dims2 value is presumably halved, right? Uh, so that means it's already been halved for us. So if we do this, we should just multiply out to the correct thing. If we want this to map 0 to 1, we just multiply by, I mean, divide by pi, right? So that's 0 to 180, which is what we would expect. So those are our indices, and presumably we just roll them out. So we'd just be like, all right, in terms of how these things are strided, we don't even know. We're going to have to look here. So the phi diff index is the part that is not strided at all. So that's the increment by 1. So the I2 gets nothing. The I1 is multiplied presumably by the count. Uh, of one, let's see, sampling res phi over two. Okay, so that's count two, right? Um, and then the I, right, is that right? So that's theta diff, theta diff, and then theta half is the full stride. So theta half, which is this one, is uh, count one times count two. Right. There's like zero chance that this will work. Um, there's way too much stuff in it. But that's what it says, right? So we've done something. Uh, and we can maybe call it a day. <laughs> um, I don't know. I was going to say, I don't know uh, what's going on here, but we can, we can check. Are we, why can't I see my source code? Do we not have debug info for this guy somehow? What happened? Try one more time. Oops. Not sure why, but it's not letting me actually view the source. Oh, it's because we're deep down in the Visual C guts. All right, so you can see we did actually get outside the table here. Um, not exactly sure why that would be. Maybe because we're indexing these slightly wrong. Um, let me let me double check that F2 part of things. But let's take a quick look at where we're at uh, and just get that part fixed because that part we should be able to fix. Uh, although this doesn't have any values here. So... Wait a minute. What table is this? What table is this? Ah, uh, I guess so one of the problems that we would have here is just that everybody would need to be initialized to a table um, that just had like one normal reflectance in it because we need to be able to load these wide so you're going to have people with zeros uh yeah and think of that so we need to do kind of like a null version of the brdf load you know what i mean um or we can do like an if zero on it i suppose but it seems better to just fill them in with actual values i would think so we probably want is something like uh null brdf or something like that And what null BRDF would do is it would just initialize the the destination. So when you actually do a sample there, um, you you won't get uh, a bogus value. So this is just initialize it to a table of one. Um, we can just do like, okay, there's an F32 that's like the like, or a V32 that's like the, you know, the null BRDF value or whatever, right? 
and it's just like or maybe it's like no reflectance or something right it's just zero uh, and so values will just point to that right let's try that again so we can get an actual run here okay so the thing runs which is surprising to me because we sort of threw so much stuff in there I wasn't really expecting it to uh, but I'm guessing we will get garbage for output more or less and we sort of do sort of don't um, that's not as bad as I was actually expecting um, so kind of surprising but you know um, so I'm happy to call it there uh, and we'll just uh, we'll pick that up on the next time we do our handmade ray I'm going to go to a brief q and A. I'm not going to take many questions probably um, assuming the stream worked at all All right. When computing the sphere by tangent, could you just nose the tangent before computing the by tangent so you don't have to nose the by tangent afterwards? Probably. Uh, numerically, I guess I don't really know. In our case, we don't have to be 100% precise, probably. Um, so probably, yes. I mean, wait a minute, let me go grab that part. Um, yeah, I mean, I assume you could do it. So since you know that these two are normal, you know that they're going to produce something that's just the angle. The difference is going to be the sign of the angle between them. You will have to normalize that one. And then you assume that these are at right angles to each other now. So diff Y and HW have to be orthogonal. So you could eliminate that one. Um, and you should also be able to eliminate uh, the one we did down here somewhere. Where was that? Yeah. So here you could do it this way. Right. Um, and then that should, those should be fine. Right. Uh, I usually don't do that till I'm actually like getting the code, uh, more specifically, but Talking about Ray and Linux and more beautiful code, there is still a GitHub issue about memory loading in SIMD. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, again, probably not going to look at that at the moment. Is the BRDS essentially a function that tells us which Ray's within the hemisphere to use? Uh, do you mean BRDF? Do you get uncanny valley impressions sometimes when looking at ray traced images? If so, what strategies might you have to mitigate that? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by uncanny valley. Not in this kind of a situation because, I mean, at least for us, we're just talking broadly here about, you know, things that are spheres and planes. So you're never going to get an uncanny valley looking at spheres and planes because they don't exist in the real world, right? Uh, oops. BRDF, sorry, typo. Uh, yes, yeah, so the BRDF function, no, it's not telling us which rays within the hemisphere to use. What it's doing is it's telling us for any given rays in the hemisphere, so one incoming and one outgoing, it tells us how much the surface reflects. That's it, right? Um, so basically, we choose before we ask it. We choose where are we trying to figure out where the light's going, and where are we trying to ask about the light incoming? And we give it those two things plus the surface geometry, so the normal, the tangent, the bitangent. And then we say, hey, BRDF, how much light should get transmitted from this direction to this direction? 
That's it. Will I finish this tomorrow? Probably not. Handmade Rage is what we use when something goes wrong in the stream or when we're trying to test stuff. My camera frame rate seems low. Um, Yeah, probably. I mean, it's being captured by Linux, right? Which can never do anything. So it's probably just not capturing the webcam because it's too terrible to do it. I'm glad the sound was fine, though. Have you thought about implementing GGX for Handmade Ray? I don't even know what that is. So the answer is no, I haven't. <laughs> Let's just assume that this is what you actually meant. <laughs> No, I, I haven't thought of implementing that for handmade ray. Um, shockingly. How much of modern skin mesh animation did you contribute to? Um, I I don't know. Uh, I guess that depends on what you mean. Haha, this is what I'm talking about, uh, cornell.edu. Okay, sorry. I'll, I'll go ahead and look that up. So, SRM. Publications. SR07. BTDF. PDF. Oop, nope, 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 nope. <clears throat> Um, so, I mean, I guess the problem here is like, yeah, this is just another, uh, like we, we wouldn't, if, if there's a database of these that we could load, then we could do it. Right. Um, but I don't know if they provide one. I mean, the only reason we did this particular uh, thing is because we could load a database, right? And, and maybe there is a, if there's a database of these, then we could certainly load them, right? But I want to say, all right, but what function choose the outgoing rays to use because it will affect the outcome of the picture? It gets fuzzier if the rays spread in more directions. Uh, no. So, so that's kind of the point. Um, let me illustrate this for you because this is important to understand. I mean, to the extent that anything in handmade ray is important to understand because it's kind of just a side thing that we do sometimes. But all right. So if you actually look at the way we started doing Handmade Ray when, when we were just building the ray casting part and we weren't actually trying to do anything with uh, light transfer, 
then what you said is sort of correct. Meaning when we have a surface and we want to know how much light is coming out in this direction, then if we only cast a ray or a rays in this direction or in a tight cone in that direction, then what we will get is something that looks like a mirror roughly, right? Uh, and if we cast rays in all the directions uniformly, then we'll get something that looks kind of like chalky, right? Or very diffuse, right? And we call this mirror version specular, right? But all the only reason for that, the only reason that's what's happening is because we have no light transfer function. So we were all equally weighted, right? We were taking all these rays and we were adding them together and just averaging, right? It was just an average of all the samples. So obviously, the more you take samples in one direction, the more the color will look like what's coming from that direction. And the more you just take samples in all directions, the more it will just look like the uniform light. So it appeared, because we were not weighting our samples at all, it appeared as if just what directions we chose to send our rays was what determined what the surface looks like. But that's only true if they're equally weighted. What the BRDF gives you is the weighting, right? And so what it does is it says, oh, well, for a mirrored surface, when you happen to ask me for things in this direction, I give very high weights. And when you ask for things in any other direction, I give you very low weights. And so it produces a mirror by weighting all of the mirror direction samples highly and all of the off mirror directions very low, right? However, it also lets you do all other types of surfaces because it can do things like having like certain fall offs or weird bumps or weird shifts and stuff, right? And so what the weighting, th what this does is allow you to have any kind of surface, not just ones that do only mirror or only diffuse or some blend between the two. This lets you actually do any kind of incoming light distribution that you want, right? Uh, and by the way, we can reverse uh, this process as well eventually for optimization purposes and say if we notice certain places where the BRDF has a lot of information and other places where it's weighted very low, we can like only take samples in directions that are pretty high, right? So we can reconstruct this exact behavior from a perfect mirror BDF by sampling along the BDF. But again, if we take the BRDF and figure out how to sample it properly, uh, rather than just assuming that it's either a mirror or either diffuse or somewhere in between, what we can do is then produce any reflectance and sample it properly, rather than just only having one sampling strategy, right? Did shader weighted skin mesh animation exist before you started meddling with it? Uh, sure. How did it evolve and do you see any future improvements possible in it? Uh, yeah, I mean, again, not really sure what you mean. Uh, my work on uh, shader-weighted skin mesh animation stuff, first of all, started before shaders could produce skin mesh animation. Um, it started when the CPU had to do uh, the skin deformation. Uh, and yeah, it was very poorly understood at the time, it's true. Uh, most of the people who were doing anything like that weren't doing it real time. Uh, and it was a few people were doing it. There were a couple, a couple different places doing it. We were one of them. Uh, Valve was one of them. Uh, and what was the other name of, oh, I can't There was another one. And then there were some weird techniques, like uh, there was a really strange one that was this sort of weird hybrid, like render software rendered version um, by the people who made, uh, it was by Sa Sax Pearson was the guy who did it. It was um, this weird game where you played like this little baby who ran around and like possessed people or something. 
I can't remember the name of the game. Mm, I can't remember the name of the game. Uh, but yeah, I mean, essentially what we were doing is just working out how we would do these things in real time. The, the cinema world, like Pixar and a couple other places uh, that did this sort of thing, did it slightly differently usually than we did because uh, they had a lot more controls they were layering on top of each other. Uh, so they didn't really think of skinned meshes quite the same way that we do. Whereas now games and film pretty much use the same more or less way of, of looking at things usually. Uh, then it was a little bit different. But no, uh, I, you know, I don't really think there's much to say. I mean, one of the main things that I contributed if to the extent that I contributed original research in this area, as opposed to just like implementations people were using, would have just been the fact that you can linearly blend quaternions. Uh, that was a big change. That's not really necessarily specific to skin to mesh animation. It's just animation more broadly. Um, but nobody had analyzed that before I did. And then once I did, then now everyone does that, as far as I know. Yeah, Toxin 16, um, so what I would say is like, I would be totally fine implementing other stuff too. Like I just wanted to implement a couple lighting functions in here. We could totally implement a GDX function. The question is what's, we need something to load, right? And we don't have to load it. Like we could just have measured parameters we build into the app or something. We just need some data, a data of some materials. So we can like load up velvet and see that it looks sort of like velvet, least as just a poor man's test. Like I just need something so I can load up something and see if it looks at all right, you know? Messiah, yes, yes, Messiah, correct. That's the game, thank you, Ryan. Uh, they were doing something totally different. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, So it's a little hard to see. I think also, because I'm pretty sure this stuff was software rendered, so the character had to be fairly small on the screen, right? Um, but you can kind of see, like, it's a really weird, like, rendering idea, but it was it was allowed them to get much higher polygon count characters uh, because it's, sort, it's almost like a voxel-y kind of render, if I remember correctly. Um, I think it was software rendered. I don't really know. But anyway, all right, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Oops. Close this down, close this down. Thank you everyone for joining me for what would have been another episode of Handmade Hero if Linux hadn't ruined everything as it always does. Um, I will be back here tomorrow when, since hopefully the sound is sort of more or less, maybe kind of working slightly, I'll go listen to the recordings to see if I think it's okay. Um, but basically, uh, yeah, uh, I'll be back here tomorrow to try and do some actual programming if Linux is okay with that. Uh, and if it's not, we will just throw the machine out the window and maybe hopefully have a camera down at the bottom where we can get a good uh slow motion video of a computer breaking apart into pieces uh as usual if you do want to follow along the series at home uh i always upload the code every night so if you pre-order the handmade hero game on our website you can uh download the code uh and uh, follow along at home with what i'm doing and i do include the handmade ray code in there in case you want to try uh, playing around with that yourself at some point um, I will be back here tomorrow to try and do some programming. Hopefully see you back here to tomorrow and hopefully it'll go smoother than it did today. Until then, have fun programming everyone and I'll see you all on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.